second. So that kind of marketing isn't working as much as it used to. So more and more companies are finding themselves in this situation, right? So these telecom companies, they get ready $50 billion. That's like putting all their chips in. Do you understand? That's a big investment for a company. And if that didn't go through, then that would have cost them everything. Do you understand? They had to make it work. So they get ready to roll it out. Everything's good to go. The telemarketing, uh, or these, these telecom companies, the way that they would give a customer that little nudge that gets them to make a decision today is they would use big telemarketing teams across the country. And these, these teams would call into whatever that heavily marketed territory is and catch all the low-hanging fruit. So they'll catch you at home at dinner time, remind you about the commercials you've been seeing on TV, let you know we're going to be in the area next week. And if you sign up while we're here, we'll give you a free install and an iPad, right? Or a free install and a tablet, or a free install and an HD TV, right? Make it real easy for customers to go ahead and sign up. That's what they would do. Y'all follow me on that? And they had these huge telemarketing teams ready to go. So that was their plan, right? They put $50 billion into it, built out the network. They got their telemarketing teams ready to go. They've marketed the territory. People know that it's coming. There's, those telemarketing teams are ready to go. And then all of a sudden, there was another law that was passed by the federal government. I don't know if you've ever heard of it before. It's called the Do Not Call List. Have you guys ever heard of that? If you're on the Do Not Call List and a, and a, and a, and a marketer calls you and you want to escalate that, it's a $50,000 fine per instance, right? When that law got passed, those telemarketing rooms were no longer a valid way to generate business. There's a huge liability there, and that would have cost that company a lot more, right? So they had to think, what are we going to do next? You don't give up on a $50 billion investment, right? What's plan B? Okay, here, here's what plan B was. We were in the cable contracting business. Guess who the telecom company's new competitor was? The cable company, right? Now the telecom company is going to be competing with the, the local cable company. You follow me? So if their new competitor was the cable company, they go, okay, what are they doing? Guess what the cable company's been doing? They've been using companies like us for years to go out into the marketplace and help them increase their, their, their market space or increase their footprint, right? They've been using us for years. We had just spent the last five years becoming the number one company in the country that does that. So when these telecom companies got themselves in a pickle and they needed somebody to bail them out, they go, what are the cable companies doing? And guess whose name came up first? 2020 Cable Vision. When that happened, these telecom companies goes, that's what we need to do. They came knocking on our door at the time. And for the first time in, in the history of that business, we had some of the biggest companies in the world coming knocking on our door saying, can you help us? And we said, sure, for a small but noticeable fee. <laughs> and here's what happened. We negotiated some of the greatest contracts that this industry has ever seen. And this is how it impacted our business. By the end of 08, we were no longer in the cable business at all. We didn't have any cable contracts. We were 100% with every major telecom provider in the country trying to market their fiber optic products. You follow me? And this is what happened. Uh, by the end of 08, the company went from 10 million to 127 million a year. Almost overnight. When you start hitting those kind of numbers, that's no longer small potatoes. That's a big deal. Uh, that's big business. There's opportunity there. Does that make sense? So um, when I go through these numbers sometimes, uh, I get to this part, people are like, okay, Jason, so what? Y'all made $127 million, y'all made a bunch of money, what's that got to do with me? If you weren't thinking that, you are now. <laughs> so here's the deal. The reason why I go over this, you gotta understand one thing about our business, okay? Every single customer, or every single dollar that comes into this business comes in the same way. One of our branded agents, whether it be an AT&T agent with the brand on his chest, or a Verizon agent, or Google. You know, Google is getting ready to launch their, their new uh, Google Fiber, and that's gonna be bringing one gigabyte internet speeds to people's houses. AT&T's looking at a 10 gigabyte product, right? All that's coming here in the near future. Now, the, Google's also going to need a marketing team like us to get that product into people's houses. It's a very competitive market, and they can't reach people the same way they used to because of technology, and I'll get into that in a second, but legitimately, that's what's happening. So imagine this, Google, you're the Google guy, I'm the Google guy, I'm the Google girl. Think about that for a second, right? These are the people that we represent. So when you put that kind of brand name on your chest, as soon as you do that, you guys, um, every single dollar that comes into the business comes in the same way. One of our branded agents talking to an existing or a not existing customer for one of our clients. And we're either giving them more products and services and bundling it, giving them more value, or we're trying to create an opportunity to win that customer over, create enough value for them to make sense so they can switch over to us. Does that make sense? Every dollar that comes in comes in the same way. So if every dollar comes in, comes in the same way, then what does that tell you that we needed at a, as a company to get to 127 million of those dollars? What did we need? Growth. But how do you grow? 
How do, if every dollar comes in, if every dollar that comes in comes the same way, comes from one, one of our agents talking to an existing or a non-existing customer. That means that that's how all the money comes in. Not a single penny comes in unless that happens, right? So what did we need to get to 127 million? More clients. Clients. More, clients. more agents. People. You can't get it done without people, right? You need people. Now look, what do people need to keep coming to work every day? Oh. Now listen, this is all public knowledge, right? Two plus two equals there's a bunch of people and they're all making money, right? So I go through that for the skeptics in the house, right? It's easy to sit here, especially with sales jobs. There's a lot of jobs out there that are different than this that you might want to try to wrap this up with or think that that's what we do. And I want to make sure you understand the difference between what we do and some kind of a door-to-door -door hustle. Not saying that you can't make money in those kind of businesses, you can, but it's not duplicable. It takes a special kind of person to go out and win in that kind of a business, right? Slinging coupon books or vacuum cleaners or spray clear. That's not what we do here, okay? Um, so we had a lot of people and they were all making money, right? This is all public knowledge, you can look it up, all right? So if we had a lot of people and they were all making money, I'm not just gonna leave it at that, I'm gonna tell you why. Because sometimes, like I said earlier, people get confused about what we do compared to what it actually is. And so these are the three things in marketing that can make you or break you. And these are the three things that separate this from some kind of a door-to-door -door hustle, right? And I wanna make sure you understand it. The first thing is credibility. Now, I don't know if you heard me earlier. One of the things I said I used to do was sell meat. You ever see those crazy guys with the deep freezers on the backs of their trucks slinging steak chicken and seafood door to door? I did that for nine years down in Houston. That's what I did when I was 19, right? I've been selling door to door since I was 17, or, or sales since I was 17, but door to door like that since I was 19. That's what I would call a door to door hustle. And there's a reason why, okay? That's not what we do here, and I don't want you to get confused, all right? Here's the deal. In that meat business, you have to understand that I had, as far as, uh, let me just do this for you guys. Um, uh, er, er, uh, how you doing today, sir? I'm sorry to bug you. Everybody calls me the food dude for more than one reason. I'm just kidding. <laughs> hey, each take or chicken from time to time. I got it so cheap you can feed people you don't even like. Hold on, I'll show you what I got. Oh, you're a vegetarian? So is the cow. Take a look at what I got. <laughs> no soliciting sign. They're like, can't you read? I said, oh, no, ma'am. I wasn't smoking. I don't even smoke. They say, I don't buy meat off the back of a truck. I said, they don't got cows and chickens grazing on the roof at Kroger. It all came off the back of a truck. Your freezer's full. That's okay. I got a PhD in stacking. I got a degree in phraseology. They call me Pac-Man. If I can't get it in there, I give it to you for free. Guys, I had a one-liner for everything. That's what I would call a door-to-door -door hustle. Not everybody's capable of that. It takes a special kind of person to be successful in that business, right? you got to go through like 100 people to find one that's got a minimum to do it. And when you do find them, um, that's cool and all, but they usually have like a chemical to dependency and they're hard to manage, right? So literally, <laughs> the biggest difference between what we do and something like that is credibility. I had none. I had an unmarked truck with a deep freezer on the back from a company nobody ever heard of, from a guy they never met before with a bunch of meat they weren't planning on buying. And in five minutes, I had to establish credibility, build value, close the deal, collect a check for two to three hundred dollars on the spot, and I had to do it like ten times in a day to make a living. Everybody's not cut out for that kind of pressure, right? That's the reason why people churn out of those businesses. And the main reason why it makes it difficult is because I had zero credibility. You know, as far as businesses go, you're not going to find a better situation than to represent the local utility. So when you put AT&T on your chest or Verizon on your chest, instant credibility. The hardest part of sales is already done for you when we work with these Fortune 100 plus companies. It makes your job that much easier. Does that make sense? Instant credibility. The second thing, prospecting. Who's going to buy what I got? Even the hustler in the street has to prospect. Long white t-shirts, right? Everybody knows what, he, what he's there for, right? You got me? So that guy's prospecting. So what I'm telling you guys, anything that you're doing in life, especially if you want to be in your own business, you have to prospect. You got to figure out who's going to buy what you got. How do you get those people either to come to you or how can you get to them? Does that make sense? That's business, okay? So as far as prospecting goes, I didn't even spell that right. As far as prospecting goes, this is the deal. <coughs> um, you know, that meat business, when, they, when I started, they said, Jason, everybody eats. I said, that's right, this is going to be easy. Mm -hmm. And then I realized when you get out there, they do, but they shop at Kroger, and they buy their meat from Sam the Butcher, and they've been shopping there for years, right? So that's a hard thing to overcome. Now, I was good at it, but not everybody can swing that, right? It takes a special kind of person to be successful at something like that. So the difference between what we do and something like that, and you got to remember, every day that I, uh, I had to go out into the universe and start from zero and start from scratch and find my customers. 
So that's great in the beginning because you got warm, you got family, you got friends, you can go out there and talk to them, give them a good deal, you're in the meat business, but as soon as you run out of all that stuff, then you're left with the realization, well, man, now I gotta go like do the most uncomfortable thing, and that's, hey, how you doing, man? I'm sorry to bug you. I'm the food dude, go grab, you know? That's what you have to do. Like, as soon as that happens, people that are just not willing to do that or can't, doesn't have, they don't have the confidence for it, they fall out of the business. It makes it really hard. So every day, the hardest part of a job like that is where are we gonna go today? I didn't want to make the decision. I'd get in the truck with my partner, and we had like, where do you want to go? He's like, I don't know, where do you want to go? Oh, let's get on a 610 loop. We're in Houston. Let's go in circles. <laughs> and then we get off and get a sandwich. <laughs> get up and go the other way. Try to get lost. And you, and you end up at a place that you've been 10 times before. It becomes the hardest part of the day. It's just to figure out where you're going to go work that day, right? So that, on top of the, the zero credibility, create a pretty hard situation for every, the average person to win. Does that make sense? So the difference between what we do and that is all of our clients have databases full of names, addresses, and phone numbers of everybody who does and doesn't already have the service. So literally, we put that list in our agent's hand, we give them a uniform, they got to just follow the list. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to follow the list. If Dorothy and the Tin Man and, and, and Toto and the Lion, if they didn't have that yellow brick road, everybody got lost in the poppy field somewhere, right? So that's what happens to sales guys, especially when you hear these people that have these bad experiences, is that's what happens. They either get into a situation where they don't have any credibility and they're trying to create it, that's hard, not impossible, but hard, or they're out there and they're trying to prospect on their own and they don't really know how to do that effectively, right? So legitimately what happens is, is they end up kind of like, phasing out, right? They end up just kind of phasing out of the business, have a bad experience, don't make any money because really what happens is they just stop going to work. You see what I'm saying? So now I'm, I'm telling you, I was successful. I put the average person, that's what would happen to them. So when you take a look at just those two things, it, you know, I could take anybody from any walk of life, put them in an AT&T uniform, you know, give them a list of people